Добре дошли на всички. Много се радваме да видим пълна зала. Много благодарим за домакинството на галерия Кредобоно и на Васила Нежарова, което беше така добра да ни приоти. На последната от серията презентации в рамките на проекта Близки срещи, Back to School, 2019 година на Института за съвременно изкуство. Първото съобщение, което трябва да направя, че презентация ще бъде на английски, но предполагам, че всички очакваме това. И ще премина от тук нататък на английски, за да ме разбират и гостите ни. So I'm very glad that we have here today Hans Christ and Iris Dressler from Stuttgart. Very happy that this will be the closing presentation of our program, yearly program, Back to School, project by ICA and funded by the Municipal Program Culture. Uh, I know Iris and Hans from 2006, where I was uh, when I was uh, a resident at uh, Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart, and uh, where uh, when I was uh, super happy that <coughs> they uh, welcomed the idea to curate a solo project that uh, I was doing uh, at the Wirtembergische Kunstverein. Stuttgart uh, called Background Action, and since then I uh, followed what they are doing, and I was always excited of uh, uh, what they are, uh, by their approach to uh, exhibition making. I'm very um, happy about this presentation in uh, another aspect that uh, so far we had uh, three presentations in the frames of our project. The first one was Maria Marina Fokidis who curated the Athens program of Documenta, of the previous Documenta, uh, and who was talking to us about uh, uh, the conceptualizing the global assault and organizing the, the kind of resistance against that kind of uh, stigmatization of large part of the globe, uh, and also about how uh, collaboration and how working together may turn a derelict building into a uh, virtual institution, uh, what she presented as a Konshalle Athen Athena. Uh, then uh, we had a presentation by uh, Merve Alveren, who was talking about the, uh, with emphasis towards historical research and how that is turned into an exhibition making. And then we had one group who were all uh, but talking about collectivity. And tonight uh, we are going to discuss the role of the curator and uh, and uh, different modes of uh, models of collaborative transcultural and transdisciplinary forms of curating Hans Christ and Iris Dressler uh, Iris Dressler have been directors of Wurtembergische Kunstverein since 2005 uh, they created um, I was happy to visit a solo project by Antoni Mutalas great Spanish artist at the premises of the Kunstverein. Then uh, there was a great show by Stan Douglas, and there is a long list of solo projects that uh, they curated at the premises of uh, uh, the Kunstverein. And then their recent projects include uh, 50 years after 50 years of the Bauhaus in 2018, uh, Titus Bunker, uh, Contemporary Art Sarajevo, uh, and then The Beast and the Sovereign in 2016, uh, with, curated in collaboration with Magma, Magba. Um, and uh, Konstverein Stuttgart, and then Acts of Voicing in 2012, uh, where, which was curated by a group of 12 curators. And the last project, uh, Subversive Practices, 2009, with the core group of 13 curators. So we see uh, uh, large uh, scale collaborations in this project. And tonight the focus of the presentation will be the last Bergen uh, triennial actually, Bergen uh, called uh, Bergen Assembly, which was <coughs> titled actually the dead are not dead. And at this moment I will give the floor to <laughs> no, maybe first of all, uh, uh, thanks a lot um, 
for inviting us not only to talk a bit about our work and specifically about some projects uh, where that we developed um, in collectives, uh, but also thank you for having us here because today and tomorrow we we are meeting many people and many artists and uh, it's very interesting so yes thanks a lot well and we thought a little bit because sometimes this notion of the curator is a little bit strange uh, because what but we also the perspective from where we are speaking is also the perspective of being the directors of an uh, institution so collaborative projects also need a certain kind of an infrastructure you create around them. So what we thought, we start a little bit uh, along uh, the functioning of the Württembergische Kunstverein as an institution, its placement in the city, uh, but also different uh, uh, methodological approaches, which maybe starts very much at the origin from where we start to things then about the institutions. So th what you see here is the entrance uh, and so the Kunstverein is here, uh, the main shopping street, the main square in the uh, Newcastle, nowadays the Ministry of Finance, the Parliament, the regional Parliament, the State Opera, the State Theatre and behind the State Gallery. So in the center, and this is quite, it's, it's a condition which you can't invent, it's simply there. We have a gallery, a production gallery for uh, artists who coming with an initiative from a local production context. We have the glass wing, and then we have maybe one of the German white cubes at all, it's 36 by 36 meters, only an entrance. Uh, overlight, but you can also darken it. You can say white cube or multifunctional hole. Porosities. So all to explain a little bit. So what we uh, we are member based. We have around 3,000 members, and the in initiative, the Kunstverein, is founded in 1827. So it's coming from this transformation from aristocracy, church into the bourgeois. Uh, ideas of the private field of art production. All the German Kunstvereine uh, also have had lotteries for art, so this is also the origin of uh, the German art market. So from there all this gallery even popped up. Uh, this means also that what we said from the beginning, that the members are our democratic base on which we are standing. And 50% of them are artists and we're doing uh, every two years, a big exhibition under a thematic fo focus, but without a jury. So the last member exhibition was three, with 300 artists. This is the, the glass wing is at least a, a shared pay, space which can be used by everybody from outside. I will, we will describe it. It's un, uh, uncurated terrain, and it's dealing also with unexpected guests. This also has a little bit to do that it's still on the, in, when you're looking on all maps of the city, the glass wing is, is not about a transparent democratic architecture or something like that. It's simply still on one of the ways in the past was used by the users of the city. So the people passing through the glass wing, coming from the shopping street with their bags going into the park. So it's, it's more this psychological moment of a space where, where it's uh, becoming uh, simply f flat in its hierarchy. And we're doing our public program there, but uh, since 2012 it's, we also make it accessible for artist group, for political initiatives, so everybody who needs a space in the city centre can, can have access and use it. So that's the idea of porosity a bit. So to understand an institution not only as a, as a, as a, as a building with a door, and everything which is behind the door is part of the institution, but that there, there is more porosity. So also the idea of the member exhibition, because our members, they are, they are they're having so different ideas about what art is, all of them, what, what their role is, that if we put a jury, we could do a normal job that we do every day, but if we say it's a member exhibition, then it should be, not, it should be curated, but not in the sense of jury, of, because what kind of, I mean, what, what would be the, the measure in 
in this kind of so, so that's a bit the the idea to understand this institution. Of course, we are the directors and we do the program, but we also try to have to have moments which are sort of uncurated because I think we need to decurate. I think we are curating too much. <laughs> This was a big, it's a big struggle in the city. It's called under this label Stuttgart 21. Is that necessary for the record? No. Ah, okay, then I go on. Uh, so, and uh, it's an investment. In the meantime, it's like all this public investment started with 2.4 billion and today is over 10 billion and of course it's delayed. It's a little bit like our Stuttgart Berlin airport, so this kind of narrative. But what was important, there was a substantial civic protest against it, partly till 50, we're speaking about a city of 600,000 inhabitants and partly demonstration with 50,000 people against it. Uh, these two photos are by No Sun Tech. He was at this time in Stuttgart and he visited uh, the demonstration and it's of course it's this between this generation uh, because they're planning to make the train station under the earth I uh, only when I'm dead I will go under earth so this is this generation and of course you have some modern protesters with this iPod Calvin Klein under trousers clockwork orange was even today uh, an issue when we met uh, so these images later appeared also in an exhibition. They were dedicated to an exhibition. Uh, then we spoke already about the member exhibition and then we done in 2009 on the shift to 2010 a member exhibition under the issue of art and society. Uh, and th there was also a group who made the entire architecture uh, and they recycled one of these blockbuster uh, cultural historian exhibition about the Ice Age for it. Uh, and there were some, these this cubes were also part of this exhibition. Then they created an agora inside the cupola and the members invited only, they can invite speakers for this situation of, of the member exhibition and they only invited speakers from the resistance against Stuttgart 21. So it was not us who were implementing this formation. We didn't ask them. They simply started to use the institution for their, for their resistance. So it's not a, that we address, they come and use. And we simply open the door. Of course, we have limits for opening the door. This is everything what is going in the direction of right-wing new wave of nationalism. Uh, this was the situation of the resistance in the, in the park with, with, with the camp. Uh, then there was a cleaning up of the park, 400 eye-wounded people. The government at this time was quite right uh, and they wanted to see bloody police. They wanted to let the violence grow. Uh, so it was an, totally un, out of any proportion. And the next day after this there were 100,000 people on the street protesting against the violence. It was not against the, the train station itself. Uh, in this moment, we, as you saw, we are very close to the building site. You can't it, ignore that. And we were planning with Keiko Say an exhibition about uh, uh, forms formation of design and formations of resistance and inside uh, we have had one section under the title The Art of Not Being Governed Like This, this quote from Michel Foucault. And uh, this was developed... I mean, that was just a parallel process, so we were planning this global exhibition about resistance and, and uh, design, and then we saw we cannot talk about um, <coughs> Korea and Taiwan, but not talking about what's going on at the same time. So this is why we somehow we, we implemented this within the existing exhibition as a kind of um, unexpected guest in yeah, But we implemented it with uh, Sylvia Winkler, Stefan Köpler, Yvonne Pedodra. Uh, These are all people from the city also uh, with whom we work together. And this is the kind of the space it was referring because there was a bench of corruption going around, this investment of course, the background 
is at least a real estate investment and it will have consequences in the gentrification of the city, etc., etc. So we, we develop even a map, we have had this map of Stuttgart which was movable, so that the protest also got a reference space for their work in the exhibition. And uh, Dan Perzhovsky dedicated some drawings and then these drawings uh, the people could copy and take and use in the resistance. And also there was people, when you saw this image of, the ten, of this tent field, it's quite interesting. The most competent people in a situation like this are the homeless people. They have much more knowledge to survive in a, in a, under the condition where you have rats uh, visiting you at night, how to get the water, how you clean your dishes, etc., etc. They, they have the knowledge. And then we gave them also our carpenter place in-house to produce their needs for their camp. And one w simple thing was uh, this kind of uh, uh, board uh, where, where it started with the placement of uh, Dan Pejovsky. But this was again not done by us. Well, this is very important. So this transfer, we only gave infrastructure. And of course, as Dan Pejovsky. And this is a shot in the exhibition. It's uh, the so-called action conference uh, with around 700 people. And we could give this exhibition space. I, it wouldn't be possible now at one example here because you have insurance values on the, on the wall. And in this case, everything was nearly reproduction, so it was easy also to open the exhibition space, the glass wing for all this kind of uh, meetings. And for me, then this was, was interesting, uh, because <laughs> uh, it was then invited in a group exhibition, this project invi was invited to Taiwan, and accidentally, because I said, I want to have certain quotes from David Harvey, Michel Foucault, directly written on the wall. And I didn't know how much they loved calligraphy. I didn't have had any idea. But then two started, and at the end it were 12. And under this 12 were three who were in uh, civic organizations against eviction in Taipei. The entrance to the museum is free. So at the end of the story, they were meeting there to have a kind of a resonance field for their actions outside. So it's every time very important. This is not activism inside the museum. This is completely bullshit. This is simply a resonance field. And it's simply a moment where a certain formation of resistance asking for moments of representation which they could use for their formations of knowledge production. So never mix that up because it's still, we are still in a highly controlled field and space of an institutional frame in which we are operating there. This is how it's developed with workshops, etc., etc. This was a comprehensive workshop over a week even about city planning. Uh, this is then an extension to the outside. And all of this is very much organized by groups who are not directly connected with the Kunstverein itself. Then artist group using that, it's a, uh, they, they, at one example, this is a group who is uh, very much working on the issue of drawing nowadays and they bring their original material into the space and discussing it together. Uh, this is a situation when, when uh, the right wing were protesting against a reformation of the educational field which uh, allows uh, teachers to speak about homosexuality. We're speaking about, this is 2014. And they opened this transparent, and you saw before the police, and the police didn't know what to do, because before the activist makes the transparent at our house, everybody goes, got a member card of the Kunstverein. So they were double-layered, legalized in their action, on the territory of the Kunstverein, and simply by the membership. So it's, you can simply 
subvert. It says a lot about the, the uh, art fields till under the conditions we're operating in Germany, uh, that it is a field where you even can be create a partnership in formations of defining spaces which are not over-controlled. Hmm? Then ways of working, uh, this is, I guess, uh, also, we started 25 years ago to work together, and uh, it was also, the, I, I came into the field as an artist, so more from a visual culture, and Iris came more from theory and art history. So one of, of these elements, you, you see the Musée Imag uh, Imaginaire, uh, of course, Abi Warburg, uh, is, is the formation of the tableau. This is what we still today doing. We, every time when we have a project in mind, we bring everything out of the computer, put it on a floor or on the walls, and have all the images plus text distributed over a space. So that you, it's not longer this idea that you're looking window for window, but that you're looking in uh, partnership, disruptions, contradictions, et cetera, et cetera, before you even could start to think about a project in a curatorial uh, conception. And uh, then we have, this was about body images in art and science, so we have it, this is Sigrid Schade, an art historian, this is this strange guy who makes this uh, plastinations of bodies, there's Andreas Bröckmann also at the table. We made a four days meeting, and for this meeting we thought about how to mediate them, our archive, on the project, and then we developed an exhibition before the exhibition. So we conceptualized our uh, research work uh, and brought out all the different uh, images, again in different constellations, and all the images were fixed on this metal by uh, magnets, so they were movable and re we could rearrange it. So it's a kind of, it became a tool, but on the same side, uh, the tool is also an exhibition. Uh, it became quite successful. Then, of course, when you have an, an overflow of uh, constellations and a montage in constellation, as Kluge would say, uh, you even uh, have to find different focuses. So here were 10 texts and uh, 10 images, and you have to look through this uh, uh, slides, I don't know, loop, uh, how you call it, optic, and then you see one uh, of the images as a reference, and then there was again a time-based reordering of the entire material. At one example, between, at this time, they were still called monstrosities from the Charité. But to connect this, at one example, this, this, this is not accidentally. This is loaded with art history, that this finger is in this direction, in this figure. Uh, but then, at one example, to have a sequence about the pregnant man as a structure of uh, uh, reading of the images. And from this development, at the end of the story, this kind of tableaus entered uh, then the final exhibition in 97 and were embedded uh, in the exhibition in neighborhoods, but very different from the representation of the artworks as such. Uh, what you see here is uh, a piece by Fernando Arias, uh, this is his signature as a tattoo, and he offered on the Arco in Madrid to take layers of the skin off, and you could buy then the, the uh, signature. And this extended. This is now uh, the parts of the group with, uh, uh, we're working with on the exhibition Subversive Practices. And if we have limited space, we even start to make this kind of work in the exhibition space itself. So there were people coming by. So the audience was there. Also to have this kind of processes, not every time. Sometimes you need off-record meetings. 
Uh, but as much as possible, we also try to make this process public till today. So this was the, the situation to prepare the project Subversive Practices, which was one of the series of projects we did in Stuttgart, where we started to collaborate with more than the two of us, because we are working together since mid-90s. So then you need to open up, otherwise this is probably... <laughs> uh, <laughs> going to be too narrow and um, actually the very very first project we did in a big group with curators was the project uh, on difference one and two where Galina among others were involved and uh, as a curator uh, where where we really starting in this new, we were before in Stuttgart in, in Dortmund so we went to Stuttgart uh, really with this idea we need to open up and it was a very very first so we came not with already two, but with maybe 20 when we started there. Uh, another um, project we, we did was subvers subversive practices. Um, and um, this was basically the interest. So we were interested in the period of the art production from the, eight, from the 60s to the 80s in, let's call it, the, 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 the East and the South which was produced under conditions of um, dictatorship, communist regimes, etc. So, and basically because at that time, different people from very different generations, artists as well as art historians, were working on that. Uh, and we were interested in, in, in not only sharing that knowledge, uh, but to think uh, how can we use an exhibition as a media to show a, so a certain kind of a snapshot of a moment of research production. So not like saying this is the result, this is how you now need to read modernity again, but let's look about something which gives uh, some glimpses of, of works of research uh, um, coming from different generations with different needs. So that was basically our, our interest. And so we had uh, curators from Chile, Argentina, uh, Peru, Romania, Catalonia, etc. So you see it was, a, uh, I think we were 12 curators and this was um, there you see it. I'm not going to tell that all of them because it takes too long. Uh, and you, so when you do or when we do these collective projects, they are different approaches. Sometimes this is then also that the exhibition is really uh, a collective melange of everybody uh, um, suggestions. But in this case, it was more this sort of. Um, um, section-based or, or island-based or uh, pavilion-based, I don't know, structure. So, so each section had one curator, had one focus. Uh, but then still, um, because we wanted to have them very specific, very concentrated, but then um, according to the architecture, of course, there were a lot of interstices. So you, you had also, of course, ways in between and, and viewing access between these different pavilions. Also, to maybe to explain very short, because then, uh, if not, you, you're thinking we are si sitting on a mountain of money. Uh, the entire house has incredible capacities of storage, so we can recycle. So the, in, the architecture we, we are using are uh, based at least on what we uh, have uh, in the storage, and then one of the first element we also share with, with, with the curatorial group uh, uh, is simply a, a dossier, a PDF, uh, with as much information about the way of working uh, in the past, so that they know uh, what we can and what we can't. Like here in the context of, of uh, Argentina, it was a lot about censorship, uh, the body, violence, but also the body as a, as a mean of, of uh, resistance, uh, the interventions, public space. Also, this is the context of Chile, um, issues of transgender. Um, then there was interesting also one one uh, curatorial contri contribution from Christina Freire was was based on a collection of mail art. Mail art has been very important as a means of exchange, uh, also between the East and uh, uh, the South. Actually, um, it was cheap to distribute, and like that, the the people could 
communicate even under conditions of censorship about their works. And then um, the, at that time, the director of the, the museum in Sao Paulo was uh, the University Museum of Sao Paulo. Uh, Walter Zanini was very open and was all the artists trusted him so he re he received a lot a lot a lot of uh, these male artworks <laughs> and I, but it's interesting of course how the museum today visualizes it no the center is Sao Paulo <laughs> Is the museum and and even I mean uh, it's cheap. It, it was a cheap mean to 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 distribute art. But when we show that in Stuttgart, it all came in climatization box with the career <laughs> and these kind of well. Um, but again, also the subject was again the body. I mean, how the body is the last uh, means where you can uh, even under uh, uh, a lot of um, suppression can can ex express yourself or. This is Paolo Herkenhoff, who then became also, who was an artist at that time, but he became also a very famous uh, Brazilian curator and um, is for me one of a really important work on censorship. He's eating the newspaper, all this. Um, I mean, and just imagine what it means if you eat this, this dry paper. Um, or another, um, so, so the, the one focus was the, the works. Then in Brazil, it was more that that form of collection and colo and uh, complicity between the museum and the the artist. Here uh, it were uh, Miklos uh, Peternak and uh, Anne Marie Söcke, two art historians who were very much dealing with works who had been destroyed, for example, because of censorship. Uh, and they were thinking about ways of reconstruction. So like in this uh, manner, not to really try to simulate something new, or but just uh, arranging the, the leftovers and just dealing with this in an exhibition. Or um, this is a, a piece from, uh, was a piece of Miklos Erdely. Um, you see another part of that uh, rearrangement. Or here is a, was a piece of Gila Power. It was called... Um, um, protest uh, forest or sign forest where he so you see all these these um, plates uh, and there were messages on it uh, and one of the strategies at the time for artists to somehow overcome uh, censorship was that they used language in a very ambig ambiguous way so the censors never knew is this politics is this protest is this dada is this poetry um, and that was the same case here, but in this case, the uh, censor said, okay, let's better destroy, you never know. And then they started to, st I mean, they also collect materials, how it was uh, uh, presented before, and the conceptual material behind it. And then you see, that we reconstructed it in Stuttgart, but not even trying to simulate something what is like the, like the work, uh, the ori original work, but more like an interpretation for that situation. Um, then uh, the, the Peru Peruvian context, so, so the, the, two the art historians was a more older generation, whereas uh, Miguel Lopez and Emilio Taracina at that time, they were 20 something. And it was interesting because for, for them, it was, they, they were missing something in their art history for their, own, for their own curatorial and artistic practice. So they said there must have been something in the 80s, in the 90s, beyond what we were taught, this kind of very representative art. And then they start really to ring the bell of artists and really dig in the, I mean, really um, literary, started to dig in the, in the basements um, and um, yeah, dealing with issues of also of indigenous uh, art and the, the relation to the to the modernity or um, uh, works that are very close. I mean, they they are part of of um, I mean, using strategies of popular of, of pop art, but of course never have been recognized in the context of pop art so far. I mean, all these projects, of course, are are, are part of a long term. Uh, uh, reconfigur uh, reconsideration of modernity. I think it's a process which starts, of course, in, in the 90s, but I still is, is for, for us a very important and not finished uh, and maybe never finished uh, process. And this is where, and I think that these projects need a collaborative network because, I mean, how are we to, <laughs> to do this um, on our own? <coughs> 
um, well, I skipped this. And then also what is interesting or important for us is also to, um, I mean, understanding institutions as, uh, as platforms for long-term processes and long-term um, works. So, so when we made in 2009 this big survey of um, subversive practices from the 60s to the 80s, then some years later we we started to concentrate on some of the artists that were in this bigger show, like Teresa Boga or uh, Sergio Ceballos, again curated by Miguel Lopez um, and Emilio Tarazona. So, so we try to not only, I mean, have one season the South American and the next season this one, but really um, to keep on, on certain aspects and subjects. Um, then another example of, of these collaborative works is uh, ha had a quite a dif different result, so it was not uh, finally um, having this this section uh, and um, based, but a more more uh, a really collaborative, a more collaboratively elaborated. Um, uh, exhibition and here the the po very often these projects don't start with a with a finished concept but basically with a question so we invite the people to talk with them about the this question or aspect and then start the process uh, here it was basically an interest because it was the period when when it started that the art institution the visual art institution opened up for performances so what is the the meaning of these sort of collaborations do we need dancers uh, in exhibitions all these questions uh, so we didn't have really a subject uh, at the beginning, but the, the interest in working with dancers, choreographers and, and theorists. And then finally we choose the subject of the human voice because we thought this is all not really our organ. No, The, the art is about the more or less the silent object, the dance is about the silent body and theory is about the silent word in a certain way. So let's, let's work together on something where we are not the experts or where we are different experts. So it's for us this project is also about re-questioning what means expertise actually. Who talks about what, why and who is not allowed to talk about it and why is that? Um, and yeah, and in our discussion, so so how do we transfer performativity within the art context? We were discussing these solutions that you have. Um, I don't know, dance. I mean, sometimes you have these dancers spending hours and hours in galleries, and maybe that was not really something. This, this kind of human installations, what we at the at the final point wanted to do, but. We thought maybe let's focus on the on the audience as the main performative body in every exhibition, no? Because the way they are going through an exhibition and whatever they they connect or or and they bring also something. Of course, every or every visitor brings another knowledge to the exhibition. So let's focus on on them. Um, well, actually, one of the reasons, uh, the one member of the of the group of curators was Ranjit Hoskote, and he starts from India, and he starts to speak about the phantom of the opera and the unseen territories of the opera. And I recommend very much not to go to the music uh, play of the phantom of the opera, but to read the book, which is quite interesting. Uh, uh, so then fr from there we, we, we started a kind uh, of, of, of a play around the space. So you see the entrance, of course this is with this uh, iconic term by uh, Beckett, uh, not I. Um, and what we done then with our wall system, we simply laid it on the floor and brought it 50 centimeters up. And then you have had this entire stage over the entire floor. Uh, and this creates a very much a different uh, per perception of the space as such. It's simply this 50 centimeters makes something totally different out of the space. But it also was a platform where people disappear. There were installations on the ground zero. Uh, there were this kind of uh, um, boxes for the, uh, even for, you could say, for the prompter. Um, uh, sitting down around there and then pieces you again could uh, look 
like a video piece. Uh, the platform became this kind of playground. And what I mean, you see here very, very well, you could disappear there, there, and there. But it was also uh, something which immediately uh, dominated or set elements of the body movements of the audience completely free. Uh, there was one of the dominating uh, uh, moments when five pairs of high heels were standing in front of the platform because they didn't want to create this noise. Or it was the opposite when someone in a wheelchair on, or a group of kids were really making a lot of noise. So we used it as a, as a resonance body. Uh, it was also that people could, uh, when they sit there, they were at least, uh, it was part of the stage, but they again were in a highly concentrated relationship with the video works with, uh, which were shown there. Well, and then uh, Deufert and Plischke is an uh, artist couple also. They uh, have had this share with the, uh, shares in the exhibition with the opportunity to make drawings or text production on sceneries you see. This was highly fre frequented and then next to other elements uh, brought together in uh, one of the spaces in the exhibition. And what's happened very much in these drawings was again a reflection on the setup of the exhibition itself. The, I would say 80% of it. Uh, about the soundscape, uh, about uh, the physical appearance, uh, the disappearance, maybe the, it was also about the possible life under the stage, etc., etc. So they created an entire special uh, narrative about the exhibition as such, as, as a playground and as a stage. Uh, and of course, we also use it. This is a performance by Ines Dujak for uh, several performances and meetings, etc. And then, from this very beginning, as when we spoke about the opening up for civic movements, this is a civic chorus. Um, most of them are retired, and they uh, make different compositions uh, along the fascist history of the city. Uh, and they recognized in the stage also for their rehearsals. They didn't come for a play, they only were there for the rehearsals. So you were in the exhibition and then you could meet the civic chorus completely accidental doing their rehearsals and giving at least again another tone to the exhibition itself. Yeah. So, so, um, so that's, that's also part of this idea of porosity, right? I mean, why an exhibition should only be, be the untouchable? Why, why can it not be a place for a group of uh, artists to, to rehearse their, their whatever? Um, and then something out of this happened what was really nice. So, so you saw we had in the context of acts of voicing, we invited the first time Ines Dujak, Dujak in, a, in a group exhibition and with a performance. And then the next step was that she and Oliver Ressler they curated that exhibition, uh, Utopian Pulse. Um, and one idea of uh, Ines was that she wanted somebody to read every day of the exhibition one queer, queer feminist manifesto. So we said, okay, we will ask the civic chorus if they do this, but I, I think I just told them that it's about feminist manifestos. I didn't, I, I think I forgot to say queer. <laughs> so in the beginning they said yes everything is fine and then I got a phone call and uh, one of the person we are dealing with said okay this is now the totally super gal so they start to read the, the text and they say never ever this is this is um, uh, whatever this is too, too um, strange, too radical, we cannot read this, this is sick so, and then a week later they said, okay, we try it. <laughs> and then uh, they even said, okay, we think about that the, germ, the, the, the female parts will, will, be the, will be read by the male part, whatever. So they really took it and then they came really every day and every day they were reading one of these manifestos. They for sure know more about it than me <laughs> now. Uh, and they even did it when nobody was there in the exhibition. And then for them, uh, yeah, they, 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 it was really interesting how, how that worked. So sometimes they had even some pu public. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I, I, I skip this probably. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's another curve. This was an exhibition by Daniel Garcia and Doha, Post Capital uh, Archive. And this is, of course, but this is, well, at least it's important also. Uh, this ex exhibition have had a lot of visual element uh, as an installation, but one element was uh, that all the uh, uh, image texts, etc., etc., uh, he brought together along the question of a post-capital archive, post-capital in that sense uh, when we don't speak about post-communism. Uh, let's take a different perspective. It was a perspective of a essayist from Cuba who have to leave Cuba and uh, Ivan de la Nues and Daniel Garcia and Ducha, uh, who was born Anna Franco. And they took this question, what's it meant between 1989 and 2001? They took this frame. Uh, and uh, Daniel is not searching like us. Uh, he's searching with five search engines and he knows also how to order the material. And at the end, there was a possibility for all the visitors of the exhibition to download all the files. So it took a while till they accepted this, but then they came regular and took, <coughs> took the entire material uh, from the exhibition. This would be a lecture in its own to speak about this exhibition, so, but only as one element of open source, which goes every time along also with the development of, of the exhibition. Or, or just to, so the exhibition was, all the material in the exhibition was coming from internet, but then the visitor could take the whole exhibition in a certain way with them. Um, okay, as a final, I mean, we are already quite late, so, so we will make it short just to, to um, go to Bergen. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> the last two and a half years, I mean, besides running the Kunstverein, we, uh, we were appointed to be the, the convener or directors of the Bergen Assembly, which is quite a new uh, um, um, triennial for contemporary art. And um, yes, it was, um, it, the, the, the background was that the city of Bergen, which is a small city, uh, a, harbor city a harbor city in, in Norway, that they started to think uh, in the beginning of the 2000s that they want a biennial, but then the, the artist community actually said, okay, let's start with a conference and really let's ask us if we need another biennial in Bergen. So they made this huge conference called to biennial or not to biennial, uh, and the outcome of that were two publications, uh, one with a more global reference and one with a more local perspective. And at least uh, that what the, the was called the Bergen Assembly, so, so a structure which was very, um, uh, where, where very consciously they didn't call it a, a triennial or a biennial, but an assembly. Um, uh, and which the first edition was curated by Ekaterina de Gott and David Riff. The second were three different groups, the artist Tarek Atui, the collective free thought and the cu curatorial duo Praxis. And we were the third one to develop this. And it's really a very open structure. It gives you time because it's just every three, every three years. And um, actually, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you even don't need to make an exhibition, uh, though I must say that for us, exhibitions are quite important tools. But it was very clear from the, ver from the very beginning that on the one hand, we were interested in also using this platform as a platform for a, for a collective project, uh, and which... Um, which where where processes uh, the exhibition and the so-called public program are somewhere on the same level, so that they get all the same sort of attention. Um, we um, invited ten other curators. This was the some of you you might know. This is the artist Bano Genitoglu. This is the curator Katja Kopinikova, the curator and theorist Simon Sheik, the artist Anna Voloka Wanamwa, the philosopher and transgender activist uh, Paul Preciado, the lawyer and human rights activist Deha Borodoglu, uh, the curator Victor Neumann, the artist and curator 
Pedro Geromero, the artist Iwaka, and the architect and curator uh, Maria Garcia. So from just naming them, you see already that this is a very heterogeneous group. Um, and what, and I like, this is actually um, a quote from Maria Garcia and Pedro Geromero, who are very much working on flamenco and Roma cultures. And it's to explain actually a piece by Israel Galvan, who is one of the most fantastic contemporary flamenco dancers. It's about him, but for, for us, it's very much a nice image about how we saw that and see that group and how we understand uh, collective working. And so it turns out that there is a sense of communality, of collectivity, of how names dissolve and disappear in the rejoicing of a party. Rivellas, so those who make party, are no longer themselves and their loss of the self is a party's gain. Dancing with others, bodies moving closer together, closer still, touching, touching so much that they dissolve into each other. How do you dissolve and conserve your singularity? Your belly is too small, have mine. Take my arse, look how it moved. Your arm, your leg, your ear aren't enough, here are mine. I tear out my eyes and I lend them to you, all flesh with holes. In the topsy-turvy world of parties, the man carries the donkey, but man and donkey are brothers here. So it's a kind of, sort of, monster. <laughs> In a, in a good or bad sense, how, how that was somehow behind this project. And we started with a question, basically, uh, we got, went back to the notion of the assembly. So when they, before in 2009, started to ask uh, to biennial or not to biennial, our question was to assembly or not to assembly. So our question was, on the one hand, what means an assembly? And can an at least an, uh, a large format international exhibition really be an assembly or not. Um, it was basically for us the question um, about the relationship between art and politics, because for us the assembly is a, is a, is a really deeply uh, political uh, arrangement or tool. So, um, and already in this group the, the understanding of the relation between uh, arts and politics was quite different from the position of Hiwaka saying, no, art is just impossible. I mean, uh, the, 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 pl the planet is going to die and artists are the last <laughs> ones who will change that to the position that maybe the parody of political power is, is, is the artistic tool for, for being political or the position that actually the poetic power uh, is, is a very important tool to think the things different. So the, the main source of utopian thinking uh, is actually based on artistic practices. Um, so, so these were, were a bit the, the, the starting points uh, and we ended up, of course, if we talk about assemblies, about alliances, the question is with whom do we ally? Um, and that brought us to the dead, so to those who are not um, living anymore or not yet. So, so it's in a certain way, it's very much about a responsibility towards the past <coughs> and the future, to rethinking the past and the future. Um, it's uh, also very much about, if we say actually the dead are not dead, what was finally the title, it's very much about life. It's not about that. It's about life, and it's about life um, beyond the dichotomies of death and life, um, subject and object, sick and healthy. So that was basically the the, the frame. Uh, we were when we already invited the core group members, uh, but then also the the because the core group members again were inviting other artists or even curators. Um, we were very much also interested in long-term projects, so to understanding also the, the, the biennial as, as a format for, for long-term term projects. Um, um, and again, when to go back to the, to the title and to these ghosts of the past and ghosts of the futures, what could, could this be? And of course, one of the, the ghosts of the, the past is, is colonialism. 
And as you see, this is a photo from Bergen, so they are kind of... <laughs> it's a brand called Kolonialen. Uh, it's, it's a restaurant brand, and everywhere in the city you see this, this logo. <laughs> But also they have a, uh, uh, the University Museum, it's a small muse museum, they have one floor uh, which is dedicated to the, the colonies. It's called Impressions of the Colonies, which is already quite a title. And uh, Emma Woloka Wanamwa, one of our co-group members, she was really investigating this, this very problematic, very exoticizing way of uh, dealing with the, this these objects. So this is the, the, the ghost of the part in a certain way and of course the, the other ghosts are, uh, for me this is always the image, these are these young people, I don't know if they, you have them here also, they are not going to school on Fridays but they are, uh, they are somehow coming from the future and telling us that we destroyed their planet, right? Um, so that means also that issues of, of, of care ha had been important in this project. Um, I skip this. Um, well, then it was important that all this reflection on assemblies, politics, emancipation, complicity, debt, the sick, the poor, that uh, it was not so much for us then to f go from there to the exhibition and the public program in a, in a certain kind of illustrative way, but more understanding this of a, like a way of or like a perspective, like a, um, like something, a way of understanding and unlearning again. Um, but still, there were two two lines which you can after or now now that it has been done already. Uh, something like the dissident body and the question how to share the knowledge and experience of emancipation and resistance had been quite um, present. Um, what I said before, so for us it was not really, the, the, the idea was also not to having a group and then having artists and then the exhibition, but uh, that really some of the processes uh, um, that lead to the exhibition or to the public program, uh, pro program were as important as the exhibition, as the programs, etc. Uh, so you see here all these, I, I'm not referring to all of them, but there were really, really many things that were almost invisible. Um, one, one thing was, uh, and it was a little bit the, the Stuttgart model, we created a new place which just started because we were so many, we were 12 curators and we always were lacking a space. I mean, Norway is, as you probably know, the hell expensive and the, the, this, in, this um, Young by they, 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 I mean, the Bergen Assembly has no space, so every time we needed to rent a space, it was so expensive, so we said, okay, we need to <laughs> have a place. Um, and this is also very much in the city center, it's ground floor, it's a, it's a glass box, it's a, it used to be the restorator workshop of the museum, but it happened accidentally that they are... Hmm? For 40 years. Yeah so that we co could use it uh, and then also we thought from the very beginning why should we use it just ourselves so it was a little bit this model like in Stuttgart so we opened it up so it was from the very beginning also clear that artist groups or whatever kind of groups from Bergen could Maybe use it. So this way, this way opened in, in, in April so long before so this way, it's quite important that you have an infrastructure in the city uh, which is clearly not only occupied by the peak of the uh, assembly as such, um, but I still would say it's also showed a deficit because normally a space like this should bridge every time between the different formats. Uh, so this was not given at this moment. It was only that it's again a kind of a tricky uh, aspect that it's that the, this formation of these triennials, they don't create long durational interaction with the local community. So it was a little bit the idea to set up the space as early as possible and as open as possible. Uh, and as there is an incredible over-regulation of everything in the public sphere in Norway, uh, this was a less regulated, of course it has opening times and things like that, but it was uh, uh, very well achievable for, for the people on site. 
Um, so, so you could see here, I mean, there was just this board. So, so people, whenever they see, okay, there's this day is empty, they could just write and say, okay, I'm coming with these and these people or this and this group. But it was at the same time, it was also the space for, it was our working space, it was space for the public uh, use. Uh, we had one, one important project uh, was the Parliament of Bodies, something that Paul Preciado and Victor Neumann started with Documenta 14. And this is one of the projects we think it's really important to go on with and to to really have it not only in the context of Documenta, but it was in Warsaw and um, just use it also or, or, or give it a space also in this uh, context. Um, which always comes with a certain kind of architecture, you could say, or, or, or living sculpture. Um, yes, you see there was our program, but um, uh, it was called Belgin after this uh, Turkish singer, Belgin uh, Salimzimer, I still don't <laughs> think that I really pronounce it um, fine, who in the 80s was this kind of Arabesque singer, quite well known in Turkey, um, and she named herself Bergen. After the city Bergen, she saw a postcard and she said, it's so beautiful, so, so I, and Belgin, Bergen is phonetically quite close. So, yes, and then, so she was very su successful, but she had a very jealous uh, husband who, during a concert, showed acid in her face, so she lost one eye. And then she said, well, I'm not going to stop. So she, she even more was present on the stage, uh, get successful. She constructed this very complex, sophisticated hair um, styles, you know, to cover the, the lo lost uh, eye or this... Yeah, and at the end of uh, this, uh, because at least, but she never could really divorce, so so she was very strong, but at the same time also weak, and what finally happened is that her husband killed her. Um, even though she's still today a figure of um, of resistance in the, all the context of domestic violence, um, and we, it was a little bit our saint also in this project, because I think we, it's it's. I think, we think uh, if we think about processes of emancipation, it's not only about something heroic. It's also about vulnerability and about weakness, and that we need to th need to think this together. Um, so this is why, and this is why this this ambivalent figure became uh, uh, quite important to us. Um, maybe because it's read my further. Projects, but it's also what Iris said in the beginning. Of course, this is uh, this is a group who translated the list. The list is all the people who died at the uh, well in Europe after they uh, uh, migrated, and uh, of course on the way to Europe. So we're speaking now about thirty-four thousand deaths. It's a list by an NGO, which is uh, every time on the most in the actual level, and then there's a date when it can be trans. Uh, in the Sobano decided uh, to make that in a different form public. Uh, in Bergen, it was in a daily newspaper, like an insert. But it also means that people, a group, have to come together to translate every case into Norwegian. And the, 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 the act of performing, of mourning, maybe, starts there. But this group became then also part, one of the societies of the Parliament of Bodies, because it's meant also something when you are in a very systematic process to translate an Excel file. So this, and uh, they started to dis discuss from this level on the uh, structure of language. These are images, and when Iris said in the beginning that we uh, invited projects which already existed in certain formations, then also because we wanted to get a little bit rid of this notion, we invent. Especially in participatory projects, experience is a very valuable uh, aspect. So also to take away from this concept of the triennial that now a new message is coming to this planet or something like that. Um, so this was with the Parliament of Body, it was also with the list. Um, 
But um, maybe we just skip all this no, and um, whatever. Um, and just just so, so there were many processes which were as we said uh, so so the translators of the list uh, became they are of course normally invisible but they are not only just translators no they are really part of the project um, but besides of these um, these elements there were also there was also this exhibition on five different places just to finish with that. Um, um, where again we not like in the context of subversive practices where each space ha was curated by one curator and or or organized by sections but it was really reconfigurating all the time the different aspects of the exhibition um, and maybe just because i said that it was also Well, okay, then we stop, but it, maybe also to uh, this piece by Annette Hoffmann, she's an anthropologist, but in the beginning worked together for the first presentation of the piece with two designers. And what is striking with, with this piece, and maybe this is giving a kind of an idea of, well, not the entire exhibition, of course not, but uh, it was a very minimalistic entrance piece uh, with at least white as, as the first what you saw when you entered we don't have an image was a white wall and then there were this mini projection of text and the text was uh, came from an archive so there were germans who recorded the archive in the colonies and partly in this case uh, of Africans who were in the army fighting in the First World War, were then in prison camps in Germany, and anthropologists and ethnographers went there to record their voices. But they were not interested what they saying. They were only interested in recording the melody. So they were recorded on these old wax rolls, wax rolls. They were laying for 70 years somewhere in a sound archive uh, of a storage in Berlin. And then they, it's needed 70, 90 years. She, starts, she needs a lot of time to translate that because also some of the dialects were lost and things like that. She had to find people. So it's a 15 years research of the process of translating this. And then this melody got a voice and what they said was what the content was. There were very clear political demands on the conditions how they were in the prison, that there is this and this officer who still have to pay my cow from this and this deal. So the entire imagination of us as a civilized configuration which put a machine in front of someone and imagine the other only as the object which has a mouse and can bring out of tone, but maybe never realize that what the machine is doing. Of course they realize. They realize that this machine is a sender. They realize that this is a transmission of a message. And the, the nice piece of this uh, is really that when you're speaking, actually the dead are not dead then this voice is coming back after 90 years, very alive. And the, in the exhibition we were looking a lot for positions which have had these moments of power, of moments of power which you may not recognize under the normifications and maybe also the canon, canon of standardized formations of art production. So it was this, so we could go now for more examples, but we can leave it at, at, uh, uh, at this point to speak about five exhibition sites with one artwork. Okay, thanks. But it, it refers to your work in Stuttgart with the Kunstverein, and I'm sure this question has been asked of you. Uh, but I think it's an important question for the situation in, in Sofia, in Bulgaria, basically. So you have how many members of the Kunstverein? 3,000, and they're all artists. Or 50, but 50% 50 is enough. Imagine 1,500 opinions. 
how do you navigate? How do you manage? Um, your your program is is probably not really uh, very popular with your with at least some of your members who might artists who might be um, progressive minded people, open minded people, or just more traditionally minded. So this is this navigation in the city politics, but it's not really city politics. It is the community of Stuttgart artistic community, and you navigate your program, local, international issues, agenda, how is it perceived, and all of that. Well, first of all, it's very important. It's an heritage we got. There was a time in the city where uh, even parents who get a baby, they, with the birth of the baby, the baby got the membership of the Kunstverein. So, so it's a kind of a bourgeois heritage. Huh? Then there was uh, there is another heritage. This was the director uh, Tilman Osterwald in the 70s, and in the aftermath of 68, uh, and uh, a politicization of, of art institutions. At this time, there were even five, 400, uh, 4,500 members. Uh, then this, this um, it seems to be that there is a critical mass. Uh, also from this elder, uh, older generation. And then it became more and more this uh, typical, because it's a super big house also, it became more and more this Kunsthallen style of the directors after this. And when we restarted more these collective processes, we already could build up this on the knowledge of this generation from the 70s, 80s. It's very important. So this means that there is not, again, not something we invented. There is something uh, where you only have to find points where you address it. And then the people coming back because there is an interest of collectivity. We are this still this, this uh, uh, operating and under, under, uh, there is no, no way out then if we, if we want to transform this institutional landscape also it's, it's through collectivity. This means, uh, this is this, at one example, the, um, uh, Stuttgart is, is, uh, was one of the hotspots of the Red Army fraction of this terrorist group. Um, and uh, you have a lot of this generation who can't, couldn't afford or finish the academic education because they were under the ban of communism. This was a special law in the uh, 72 in Germany. So you have a group of people of 70 years old, they can't afford to pay the teas, but when Lazzarato is speaking in our, in our space, they stand up in the third line and have imperfect French and high intellectual question. So this is a precarious academic bourgeois group. And they came back also to the institution. And then uh, the navigation, also to explain a little bit, this year it was for me not possible and for Iris, but when we, do the, uh, when we do the member exhibition, I nearly communicate with everybody. It was for me a little bit strange to do this project is there in Norway, far away from home in a way. I was partly sometimes homesick, even if it's still Norway and Europe and you know, cultural approaches, the, the homesickness is much more the moment where you are very close operating on a daily basis with uh, the audience and your members. Um, and then there are different formats. At one example, every last Wednesday in a month we have a kind of a meeting, sometimes five people coming, sometimes in the preparation of the uh, member exhibition. It's uh, a group of 100. And it means also that the topic of the member exhibition uh, is not something we made. So we, we have a group, a smaller group of artists with whom we discuss that. Uh, and then we present that in the Jurfix. And then we have a discussion with till 100 people about it. And they turn very much because they, they, they have so they turn our concept around upside down. The last discussion was, I was, this was tough. Uh, and so this is a permanently, it's, it's, it's not a question of so much the representation being in the Kunstverein, 
uh, this important international house or something. It's not about that. It's a moment where we start permanent and regular communication because the reality, if we're looking for artist production, also in Germany, the reality is that the most artist production happened from a small village of 500 inhabitants till the capitals of, of the regions. And this is mirrored also in our membership. If you, and we do a quite demanding program, uh, um, but, but I think it te needs time so that people start to build up trust relations, they understand that um, somehow there's something for them to, to pick up, that, they're, that there's of course also a, a discussion culture, etc. So it, I think it's, um, it just needs time and, and the opening of the house to say this can be shared, that was a very important step to uh, to, and this we didn't do as a marketing tool, it was just meant that this is open now and then it took another time before they were really also on the transfer, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think it's basically ab about time and openness and, yeah. It needed a long, so it was a very long process, so this process is a super slow, so this is not, uh, you can't write in a concept that it's one that should work like this. It's, it's, and I would say it has to do with the physical position of the building in the city. It's the most central cultural institution in Stuttgart. And this is, of course, hardly to create somewhere in the, in the more peripheric uh, space like that. Um, I mean, it's coming from the 19th century. Ours yeah. was built in, constructed in 1827. Um, and uh, nowadays they are 200. They basically they don't have have no collections, but so they are very much focused on the contemporary art. But they are still they are very different. That's true. I mean, there are some. Um, um, more re related to a contemporary um, context and others more to a modern, uh, they would be, I would call them probably more modern art surroundings. Anyway, but, but um, I think they have all their own sort of com communities because they are all member based. So that's, uh, and there is, I don't know if it's competition or so, but, but I think there is, um, because it's so member based and so much local locally based uh, or, or based on a local um, communication at least uh, this is what it gives it in the most of the cases its specificity um, I, I would say. This had 250 organized in the uh, in a central organization but they had all their 400 Kunstvereine in Germany and about the competition I don't see that. It's, it's uh, um, this would be a term in a landscape where we're still speaking about the luxury of a public paid surrounding. And if you, uh, in, in, the, in this neoliberal idea of competition, where you speak about the economy of attention, uh, about this more symbolic values which you can add to a program, uh, I would say, uh, this in this form as a, as a concurrence or competition did, doesn't exist. So when you, at one example, uh, the nearest uh, uh, Kunstverein in the size we are running um, is, is in Karlsruhe, is by Anja Gasser. The profile of the program is very different but incredibly strong. So what is, it's more for me the image is about that you can uh, mirror an incredible heterogeneity of this field of contemporary art production. Uh, so, um, and this is not by uh, by simply saying we we create uh, a difference between uh, two of them. Um, so, this this I this I wouldn't uh, see this way. This is maybe when you're speaking about programs of gallery and you speak about the market, but we are not on a market. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Is the dead or not dead? What happened to the living? Huh?
if the dead are not dead, are the living more or less living? Nobody is a dead every single life. Yes! If it's a dead or not dead, it's also that you have new partners to discuss. <laughs>